Well, hey there, everyone. How are you doing? It's Christy here, and I'm trying out something a little bit different. I finally got around to watching the OBS in tutorial video that Michael Rollins made for me back in September. I've been meaning to do this for a while, but there's just a balance that has to occur between making content and learning how to make new content. And I'm trying to find that balance. Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly happy with Google Hangouts. I think that there, it lacks a lot of flexibility and I've been really interested to see what other people have been doing. And so this is my attempt at two things, really. The first is to have an attempt at trying out the software. I want to uh, use the software also for, um, for my work. And so this is a nice little twofer here where I get to use, uh, use the things that I learned in Michael's video and also try to put something together in terms of a feel for myself. So part of this is me trying out the software. But another part of it is that uh, I want to try this notion of a radio program or almost like a podcast program, but without quite so much of the podcast format, more of a sort of a live chat. And I'm thinking about doing this once a week, having what I think would maybe run from about 30 to 60 minutes and it's going to be me discussing live politics once I have the software mastered. I am planning on doing this as a live broadcast rather than as a recorded one, but I thought in the first instance I should just get the technical things down, make sure that everything that I have is working properly, rather than putting on a live stream where <laughs> there's no video and no sound for half an hour. Uh, so so yeah, that's that's basically what you're going to you're you're experiencing now you've got this sort of more free format chat where i'm just gonna have a little chin wag with you i will also be in the future probably bringing up images of newspaper articles and other things but at the moment what you guys are uh, looking at what you're listening to is me but what you're looking at is my trip to mont saint michel in november i went with a friend to france for about five days we drove out to a very western part of france in the north there is a oh it's a monastery well it was a monastery now it's more of a touristy thing although there are still people on the island if you want to call it that <laughs> this little dirt um big rock i guess it's a, it's a really super big rock it's not really i don't know what is it, what do you need to be qualify as an island is it like a mountain that has to be so high or is it literally anything that's above um, sort of the water level and growing thing is an island. I don't know. Someone smarter than me, maybe, in the comments can tell me about that. But anyway, Mont Saint Michel is uh, it's sort of on on the Channel side of northern France, and in fact, quite often the British or the English at the time were tried to invade during the Hundred Years' War and other times, and they they were not able to take this particular fortress. So you can see it on the on the screen right now. It's a a massive rock and they built a monastery on it and then around the monastery some natural like village things took place you know there were people who lived there to do housing uh, just you know provide services for the monks and the nuns or whatever and it's been sort of hand preserved over the centuries in various formats it was at one point a prison i think during the french revolution and then there was a campaign a national campaign to sort of reclaim it as a, a national historical treasure my friend and I were, were quite keen. He's also a bit of a, a shutterbug, a photog. And I, through my YouTubing, have really increased my appreciation for photography and composition and trying new things out and testing out the limits of my, my equipment and my own knowledge. So these photos that you're looking at are just uh, some stills. I haven't made this into a video postcard the way that I did Florence. And because I hadn't had the chance, I thought that I would throw them up as the background while you and I have this little chin wag. Yeah, so that is basically it. I wanted to, like I said, test out the software. I'm thinking about doing a more of a free-flowing, interactive, with a chat, rolling, sort of once a week discussion. This is a little bit of a way to test it out. And so let's let's talk. Um, right, well, I guess one of the things that we can we can discuss pretty quickly here and and for those of you who are American following American politics, you'll know that Steve Bannon has been talking out of school. Apparently, he's been saying some perhaps truthful, truthful things about the president of the United States, and that is causing more drama. Um, I'm I'm 
in all honesty, for all the sort of everyday stupidity that ends up coming out of the White House, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm finding myself weirdly in a position where I am both progressive in terms of taking society forward and moving the goalposts in terms of equality. And the notion of equality is ever expanding and ever getting wider and more inclusive. But at the same time, I long and really yearn for a president that I could respect. It's been a very difficult thing to watch the office of the presidency degrade into... You know, I'm, I'm worried about using sort of classist language because simply because something is, you know, low brow, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's inherently bad. I think that the problem comes from the fact that Trump ultimately has contempt. I, I think that's the problem. He has both contempt and an, a vast amount of ignorance, which in combination end up really doing damage to the office of the presidency. And I say that because I actually, I really do care about our constitutional structure. I really do care that we preserve the freedoms that have been handed down to us and we preserve and expand those freedoms for more people in the next generation coming up. But there is a fundamental problem when you, when one, let's say, cannot respect the people who are holding the office. I think that even with, when it came to George W. Bush, I thought he was a complete idiot. I did. Um, I, uh, I believed, I think it shows he lied about weapons of mass destruction in order to get us into a war that was unjustified on empirical grounds. But I never felt that he I never felt the kind of degradation of the office of the presidency with Bush that I perceive with Trump. It's not merely his fourth grade level language, his emotional temper tantrums. It is also the fact that he is using the office to profit himself with his hotel in DC doing very well or being at his golf courses, being at his own properties. I find that that is particularly distasteful. It, it smacks of the kind of oligarchy or um, oligarch plutocracy, sort of a, the worst bit of a, um, an illegitimate government that is like Putin. It's there to make the people at the top money, as if it were a corporation, finding ways of using government power to enrich themselves and them, their families. This is actively what the Trumps are doing, whether it's Ivanka Trump wearing her own clothing line so that it sells out, or um, writing books for it, or uh, promoting their properties, or even, you know, going on holiday and taking the uh, Secret Service with them to, like, for the whole family, spending millions and millions of dollars so that they can go skiing. <clears throat> I don't want to begrudge anyone a holiday. I'm, a, I'm in Europe. I love my 30 days of paid vacation that I start every January 1st with. I wouldn't give it up for anything. On the other hand, there is a little bit of the fact that they are living on the taxpayer's dime when they don't have to. They're perfectly capable of, you know, finding holiday situations that aren't going to uh, bust the, the bank account for taxpayers. And I think that this is why it's, it's not just that Trump is an idiot. It's not just that he is a racist. It's not just that he's a sexist. It's not just that he is a transphobe and a liar and most probably a tax cheat. Um, it's, it's also to the ghost, it's, it's not just the flaw sort of with him personally, but the entire sort of family nexus and the way that they are not only degrading the presidency, but using it for themselves. I, I do, again, find it um, a real threat to our democratic legitimacy. And, the you know, democratic legitimacy is, it, well, in terms of the, the concept, there's probably, you know, more we can go into. But when I talk about that, I'm talking about the fact that we are governed, 
you know, we consent to being governed. And part of the agreement that we have as Americans is even if we don't like the government, we know that there's there should be, before Republican gerrymandering and other attempts to, to stop one person, one vote, there should be a fair chance that a party could win at an election. And that fairness is part of democratic legitimacy. The idea that you're tilting the table so that one party can never win, that degrades the quality of our democracy because we stop having democracy and we start having one party rule. Roy Moore in Alabama refusing to acknowledge the results of an, an election is precisely an attack on that kind of democratic legitimacy. It's saying that if my party doesn't win, the policies aren't legitimate. There's a difference between saying, I disagree with those policies, but they were put into place using the procedures we all agree upon. And therefore, whatever outcome, as long as the rules are followed, comes out at the end of it, that's a legitimate outcome. But now we have legitimate outcomes being denied by people who don't have a vested interest in democratic legitimacy. Roy Moore wants a theocracy. He doesn't care about you know, protecting one person, one vote, if it means it would stifle or stymie or create some sort of barrier to enacting his, you know, notion of what God's kingdom in this, on this world, in this world should look like. Those attacks on democratic legitimacy, the attacks on, you know, election quality, the attacks on the FBI and, and our other investigatory bodies, of course, we're going to see partisan debates when it comes to the issue of congressional investigations. I mean, we saw that going back to Ken Starr, for those of you who remember that far back. Um, but, you know, there was always a, a contestation about the scope and limits. But I don't remember Democrats actually questioning, like, going after Ken Starr's ability to even do his job. And that's where Trump is. He wants to sort of undermine even our basic fundamental trust in anything for his base, in anything except his word and what he says and the reality he puts forward. That is, to me, very dangerous. And it wouldn't be so dangerous if so many people weren't buying into it. And that's, for me, in addition to the degradation and the degrading of the office of the presidency that Trump has, how should I say this, has basically enacted or embodied in the last year. It's that people who call themselves patriots, people who call themselves defenders of American values, are tolerating it. And they tolerate it because it's their guy doing it. Um, and I suppose it's always easier to criticize when it's the other party than it is to hold yourself accountable. But I don't know that we could actually, you know, survive with democratic legitimacy if we don't break this Trump cycle. Part of breaking the Trump cycle will be in 2018. And 2018 is not going to be an easy year for Democrats. Um, we, we do have the wind to our backs in terms of where people are. People are upset with the president. People are upset with Congress, especially um, those who I think the tax bill is not going to give them nearly the kind of recognition and, and um, you know, the accolades that they want, the praise that they want. Um, but that doesn't mean that automatically solves the gerrymandering problem for the congressional districts. Those are still out there. They're still gerrymandered as heck. It doesn't magically fix voter laws that are going to make people um, more obstacles, make it more difficult for people to get to the polls, make it harder for people to exercise their constitutional right to vote, to say who, what policies they want, what taxes, that they, things that they want to pay for or not pay for. So it's not enough to talk about the Democrats, me you know, the messaging um, or other sort of party problems. We have to be very cognizant of the fact that in order to win these seats back from the House, we don't need to get 50% plus one. A lot of these seats, we need to get like 65% or 60%. Um, it's got to be a sweep. It's got to be a massive tide of enthusiasm or anger. Either works, to be honest, in terms of getting people out. In fact, anger probably works a little bit more 
in order to fix the problems that all these Republicans have created, in order to start rolling back the anti-democratic procedures and policies that they have in place. We really need to win in 2018 because in 2020, we're going to have another election, but then we're going to have the census. And if we are not building on democratic victories from 2018, then the chances of us undoing the gerrymandering that would come about as a result of redrawing the lines and seats after the census will be much more difficult. So coming ahead in in 2018, it is going to be necessary for people who want to see change and see different policies. It's not going to be one election or two elections or three elections. You've got to think about five, six elections down the road. These are generational changes that we need to make because of all the damage that the Republicans have done to voting, to the tax system, to the health care system, overspending in the military, blowing up the deficit. And it's going to have to be Democrats being the responsible ones coming in and, and cleaning up the mess and trying to restructure the tax code in such a way that the kinds of wealth that's produced by people working in the United States is actually enjoyed by the people doing that work. And ideally, not just in the United States. If you do a job and you make your company money, you know, you're making them profit, you should also be profiting from that, not just some sort of hourly wage. Or, you know, if you want to talk about my perspective on things, I think the redistribution of corporate profits uh, to employee bonuses is something I would very much like to see on a sort of Goldman Sachs level, but for everyone. I think Walmart should take, um, have to be, <laughs> give a portion of their profits in form of bonuses to their employees in order to offset the low wages they get to them. But this is, I'm getting on a, on a sidetrack here. 2018, it's going to require getting uh, people who are on the fence or independents or who don't vote in off election years motivated. It's going to require getting people to go to the polls early because another thing we see is that um, Republicans will under-resource areas where voting for Democrats is high. So it's going to take, you know, there's just more, the kinds of situations where people run out of ballots. Right? There's a big turnout, the city isn't prepared, they end up running out of ballots, people are standing in line waiting to vote. Um, all of that stuff, the idea of provisional ballots and how those work in educating people or whatever else are in terms of the laws in your state. 2018 is going to be absolutely huge. It's going to be uh, an opportunity to start the pushback and not just in terms of rhetoric, but in terms of political power, of saying, no, this is ridiculous. We're going to have a Congress that holds a president responsible when he engages in what are potentially illegal activities. We are going to hold the president responsible when um, he won't give over his tax information. And maybe we need a new federal law about um, releasing tax information because uh, in order to avoid conflicts of interest, we need firmer laws on ethics put on the executive office. All this, the uh, um, emoluments clause needs to be clarified. There's so much work for the Democrats to do just on the issue of preserving the integrity of the office of the president, let alone all the voting rights, all the health care, all the tax stuff, all the military stuff, education, fixing the damage, fixing damage to national parks and, and wildlife in areas that he is, uh, t- Trump has turned over to be uh, spoiled by corporate profits. So many things. I mean, it's like two years would not be enough to get all of the things fixed in time. So to make a good start on that process, we have to uh, turn 18, 2018 into a year of activism and a year of action. Well, actually, I found it, you know, easier than I thought to, to babble on for. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a show for 30 minutes, but at least in the last, uh, that little political bit, I was able to um, just basically babble on without too much interaction. I don't have a live chat here to interact with as these shows often do. In the last few minutes that I'm going to be spending with you, I thought what I would do is give you some updates on things that I've been doing in case you've missed them. Uh, Let's see. So first of all, I am going to put this up. This will be my video for today, my little tester video to see how all of this works out. And if you do enjoy this, if the sound of my voice is soothing and calming, it's something that you think you would like as a a weekly podcast or sort of a YouTube radio event, um, my thoughts right now are to do it on a Thursday 
usually, like, I get out of work, I could be home um, by sort of like 6.30 uh, in the evening my time and set up. So that would be like 12.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. And, uh, or, you know, 7 o'clock if people um, wanted things to start at the top of the hour. So it might be like a lunchtime thing that you could listen to for, um, for a podcast. Otherwise, of course, you'd be able to just uh, log on afterwards and have a, have a look and a listen to see what images that I put up. So that's going to go up today, hopefully. I hope that um, for all this work, it actually does turn out all right, and the sound sounds okay, and the video images that you're looking at from uh, Mont Saint-Michel are also... Um, all those were taken by me, by the way. So if you have any complaints about the photography, you can you can direct that complaint at me. <clears throat> um, yeah, so once this has gone up, the next thing I want to put up is I, ha I appeared on um, Polite Conversations and had a lovely chat with um, two lovely ladies. Uh, I'll give more information from that on that when the video goes up, but I'll, I will be mirroring that content. I had planned on doing that actually as my content for today. And then I uh, did a crash course on OBS because it seems like a good digital solution for a, a recording problem that I have and uh, did all that training and practicing with various things and then came home to do a little uh, test run as you see. So that is going to go up either uh, tomorrow, I guess tomorrow's Friday, so it will probably go up on Friday or Saturday, possibly. Um, but my goal would be to have it up for tomorrow. And then the last thing, um, oh, and that was a um, really great uh, conversation. By the way, we discussed um, alt right and the alt right and the woman, the woman issue that they debated a little while ago. So I don't want to say too much more about it. It's a it's a great chat, um, and I'll I'll let you listen and enjoy it. The only other thing is, oh yeah, that's right, my uh, my appearance on Destiny's channel. When I don't know if you guys saw it, but of course you know Kevin and I had our recent happy hour, which maybe I can start to work the happy hour with OBS as well, which would be really exciting and cool. I would like that very much. During that, somebody in the chat asked me about going on to Destiny stream. And I'm just saying because I don't, I, I'm not a Twitch person. I'm definitely like a YouTube girl. My, I'm living in the, my little YouTube bubble. I am, I was aware of Destiny because I have seen him with his debates and his debates with more uh, notorious idiotic YouTubers, for instance, um, well, the no bullshit, uh, do you call it a debate? I don't know. I, I would just call that, I don't know, a, a reasonable person and someone having a temper tantrum, a verbal temper tantrum, no bullshit was having that in a, in a hangout for hours on end. I also saw the, the Destiny hangout with, oh gosh, who else was, um, it was a bunch of people, we talk about it. Anyway, during my happy hour with Kevin. Someone asked, hey, would you be interested in talking to Destiny? And I said, yeah, of course. It sounds like it would be great. And he got in touch with me and said, hey, I heard you want to have a chat. I'm like, yeah. And he said, cool, I'm going to be on like in, well, he, yeah, in the next day, basically, within 24 hours. And I had like, no idea what we we're going to talk about, but it ended up being a nice chat. It wasn't, um, uh, the, the phrase circle jerk came up a lot. And apparently Destiny's audience is used to some sort of confrontation, some sort of back and forth about a topic. And he was, he and I more just had a, a kind of a, a venting situation, like a, a venting chat where we expressed our mutual frustrations with various bits of YouTube life and the lack of argumentation and poor critical reasoning and just the general low nature of some of the content being put out on YouTube. And that was, it was a good chat. I had a, a lot of fun. It was very enjoyable. I hadn't, as I said, because I'm not a really a gamer, I hadn't had an opportunity to listen to a lot of his stuff. I certainly wouldn't, you know, be watching the gaming stuff. And when he does politics, it always tends to be in these, uh, what I've seen anyway, really hostile, <laughs> confrontational situations, which is fine. If you like that sort of thing, then it's the sort of thing, the sort of thing you'd like. But because we had a really calm, relaxed, a uh, respectful conversation that was more about exploring ideas. I'm just going to, you know, I'll say I was really impressed with the range of his knowledge. He and I have very similar interests. He's got some familiarity with, with psychology, is very au fait with important psychological cognitive biases that prevent us sometimes as people from 
optimizing our decision making. He also is interested in, in philosophical concepts and is generally seems, you know, kind of progressive and, and left. Uh, and so we just had a kind of like a getting to know you slightly nerdy chat. And it was very, very enjoyable. But because of this whole apparently confrontation style that his viewers enjoy, we did get, uh, I did get a couple like, you guys were a bit boring. Uh, but in future, I have already agreed, uh, maybe sometime in 2018, I can go back and uh, he and I can agreeably disagree on a topic <laughs> because um, yeah, I, I don't mind a, a spirited uh, debate uh, that's respectful with somebody that is making good arguments even if I disagree with them. I can, I can see the validity of a point even when I'm not convinced by it or acknowledge that uh, something would have weight even if I myself don't put a lot of weight on it, on moral questions and things like that. Less empirical questions, obviously. You can appeal to observation and count things and find other ways uh, and wrestle with observe, observing the social world or interacting with it. But as it was, we had a, a lovely little chat. I haven't figured out yet how to download things from Twitch. I've tried to get the audio so that I could re-upload it here. I'm uh, just really struggling. So again, if anyone in the comments section, if you have any tips or ideas, I don't want to download software to download a video on Twitch. Ideally, I would just like to be able to get at least the audio in an MP3, ideally the video as an MP4. But um, yeah, audio would be fine for me as well. All right, I'm, I'm looking here to see how we're doing for the time. Oh, and we're on 26 minutes. Well, with my goal being 30 minutes, and considering I hadn't really prepared <laughs> much for this, uh, my big preparation was to uh, put up the pictures. I guess in the last few minutes, what we could do is discuss some of the images that you've been gazing at in the last 25 to 26 minutes here. As I said, these were all taken at Mont Saint-Michel in France, and the monastery itself dates back to as early as the 8th century. There was a religious community that was recorded as living on that particular rock in a, a very small community. Eventually, over time, it was built up into a cathedral. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, the thing is, I, I, when I went, um, what you're looking at in terms of these pictures tends to be inside the monastery rather than there are some outside shots but um, I wanted to capture for instance just some of the the period artwork that you know when you, you're standing in these big stone buildings uh, cathedrals and you've got the the light flowing in from the big sometimes stained glass windows the artwork often gives a sense of the history of the the time that kind of is captured um, within that the construction of it and with my recent trip to Florence too I had a lot of enjoyment I got a lot of enjoyment experiencing art from different centuries it's such a privilege I don't know if we really always um, appreciate as much as we do the fact that we are living when we are because <laughs> It, it was, at least for me, to be in Florence and to be with 13th and 14th century, almost exclusively, uh, religious art. Art that was very two-dimensional, it didn't have much depth or perspective, um, the faces were quite common, there was not as much individuality in the people, in the paintings, but you could see the amount of love and attention and detail, the colors on the Florentine artwork from that period. The blues are just this amazingly deep, um, is it called azure or lapis, uh, blue. Um, bluer than the sky in this picture, for instance, just popping off the, the, um, the surface. And the reds are this gorgeous, rich red color. And their attempts to use uh, colors to indicate the, the fabrics and the richness of the fabrics and the folds in them. And to kind of, you know, after you, well, at least for me, being through seven or eight rooms of that and uh, immersing myself visually, to then walk into another room and to walk into another century and see the psychology changing, that not only did you have a sense of depth perception and depth perspective, but figures start to acquire uh, a closeness to the real person or real people in history. Scenes stop. Although, obviously, religious imagery 
continued to dominate what was produced, you get more and more of these little scenes of everyday life, of, of ordinary people, not just the saints and uh, the sinners and uh, the famous stories from history. You start to see little bits of daily life worked into the artwork, and then eventually you start to get more secular work. It's not always about gods. You can get landscapes and intimate moments and not just great people's portraits, but servants. People just going about their daily lives, a dog or whatever else is, you know, is put into these um, these paintings. And the, the move from the sacred to the mundane um, and the move from two-dimensional into three-dimensional, the move from a lack of individuality to capturing who somebody was in a specific point in time, all of that was, for me, very, very mind-blowing to experience and to, yeah, to be able to walk through time <laughs> in some ways. And Mont Saint Michel is very much the same. It's you, when you walk the streets, you're walking on in the same spaces that people have been walking since the eighth century. When you touch a stone, you have no idea the countless hands that have run there their flesh across that particular, you know, piece of, of, of granite or stone or whatever else, um, long gone, long forgotten, but they were there just like you. And that's what I really love about, about living in Europe. It's what I try to capture in, in some of these images, the idea of, um, how, how it is both eternal and temporary, you know, uh, the stones themselves are worn uh, the, the the streets, you know, um, have been beaten out and softened by how many hundreds of thousands of, of feet uh, and shoes along the way and how many pilgrims, how many invading armies, how many defenders, how many monks and and nuns and other royalty have passed along that way uh, gives one pause, or at least it gives me pause. That was what I was trying to capture, a little bit of both the life of Mont Saint Michel and also the the static nature of um, it surviving over centuries, and I think anyway that's really freaking cool. Hey, I'm over 30 minutes. I made my goal. So thank you for taking this journey with me. I hope it's turning out all right, because otherwise I would just been talking to myself for a half an hour looking at pretty pictures <laughs> to no avail. But on the assumption that this has worked out all right. If you enjoy this little 30-minute, um, maybe I can stretch it out a bit longer in the future, sort of spontaneous chats, um, let me know. Obviously, I will have to kind of build up an audience, and uh, also some things like, what days of the week have are worst for content coming out? I, I think that um, Fridays tend to be a pretty hot day for releasing videos and Wednesdays as well, but um, I'm looking for a sort of a regular time to do this, a regular day to do this. And uh, that is what I'm curious. Is Thursday a, a good day? Is there kind of a scarcity of content on a Thursday where you might want a little half hour of me nattering away about one topic or a few topics? Well, give me your comments, give me your thoughts in the comment section below. We'll see how this works. I have often tried things that ended up not going on for too long, but I'm <laughs> I'm hoping to catch up in 2018 with some finish off some of my series, but also take my channel in a new direction. And this is something that I want to try. So thank you for for taking this uh, little journey with me. Appreciate it. I guess all that's left to be said then is that I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention and watching all the way to the end of the video. And I will see you again really soon. Bye-bye.